Hello everyone, welcome to live stream 25 of the Music Hack Space. So I'm on my own for now, but I will be joined very shortly by Jerome, who is uh, restarting his Wi-Fi router to make sure we have enough bandwidth. So uh, Jerome Noel is the head of software at Amplify, a division of Focusrite uh, Innovation. He's based in London, and he was the former uh, CTO of Homeforce. Uh, Omforce released uh, the world's first collaborative door. And I dug into the archive of the Music Hack Space and found out this page. Uh, we, uh, what we, we did host Jerome uh, about eight years ago um, in June 2012, uh, where he came to present Home Studio. And it was at the time the world's first collaborative music creation tool that was not uh, on the web. It was a fully, it is still a full dough that was available. Um, and uh, so they, they did a lot of things as well. They did plugins and, and I, I think we'll, we'll get an overview today of uh, everything that that, that he's done with, uh, with this great uh, company based in France. So this is a younger version of, of himself. We can see his back of his hand here. And this is me and, and here Martin Kleng who helped at the very beginning uh, of the music hack space. Um, so Jeremy is still, still uh, expected to join shortly. Um, hello, Antonio. Good, good, to, good to have you again. Um, we're still, still waiting for, for Jerome to sort out his, his bandwidth issue. Um, so today is going to be more of an interview. If Yeah, and it is coming in. So today is going to be more of an interview. Hello, Jerome. Hey, JB, how are you? Good, good. Well, the signal seems much, much better. Okay. Uh, so Sorry, uh, I'm late. Yeah, I was basically restarting my whole internet. Uh, so if you've got Virgin Media, be aware it's not very fast to start. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we, don't, we won't recommend this. So yeah. today is going to be... Uh, to be more for an interview um and i mean you have some material that you you will go through and uh and we will welcome questions um your expertise and your trajectory uh, of 20 years uh, maybe a bit more uh has been making music software so all of your career was building uh, audio applications from plugins to even a full audio workstation and now more focused on ios uh, but you did prepare slides so i'm going to bring them up and, <laughs> uh, uh, if, if you're ready, uh, I'll... Yeah, I am. I mean, yeah. I didn't prepare much. What I did is I, I prepared just a little like summary of kind of what I've done, the little companies I've been to and kind of the project I've been involved with. And then just a bunch of screenshots and pictures and kind of I've, I've dug into my archive, trying to find some old stuff. Uh, right. Yeah, so we can just uh, have a chat together and uh, talk and about uh, software. So speaking of old stuff, I did dug myself uh, the the page that we created for the time when you when you came eight years ago uh, to present to present Home Studio. So you know a lifetime has passed since since then. You moved wow. to London shortly after, uh, and you fully settled in London now. Uh, so I'm gonna yeah yeah remove this and add your own presentation. All right. So, yeah, over to you. Well, well, just very quickly, so kind of what I've done, I've kind of started at Home Force in the year 2000. Uh, before that, I did some engineering school. I did have like a placement, like a year in GRM, which was a, um, a research center, a bit like IACAM, a bit smaller, also older, uh, in the Maison de la Radio in Paris, which is an amazing place. Well, I think, JB, actually, you've been there too, right? Um, so, yeah, so that was that. Absolutely. Uh, I also work there, yes, a bit after. Yeah. Um, then, so yeah, uh, I joined Homeforce. Actually, I wasn't, I think you, you said I was a founder. I wasn't, actually. I joined the company maybe one year after it was created. Uh, it was people from my school uh, who, who created that. Uh, and yeah, I just joined them uh, one year later. So I wasn't the co-founder. Um, so Homeforce, yeah, Homeforce makes plugins, a lot of them. Uh, I think we would go back uh, on that and their designs. Uh, some of them are pretty funky. Uh, they're all pretty cool. Uh, and then Home Force, well, actually Home Force was created to make uh, the Home Studio. So that was kind of the main 
project uh, we, we had in mind from the start, but it took us something like 12 years to make it. It went very slow, and the idea was we started making the plugins to kind of finance uh, the rest. Uh, so we did that. Then uh, I moved to Foxrite in 2012. Uh, actually, that's when I met you, JB, because you came to Paris. Um, we were talking, uh, Foxrite was interested in uh, um force technology. Uh, so that's kind of what, yeah, it, I think was an opportunity also for me uh, because the uh, any kind of uh, bigger partnership didn't really work out. Uh, so I joined Focusrite, uh, which makes audio interface. We can discuss, but I think they're pretty good because they are very high quality and also affordable uh, and for a lot big range of people. So it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, Focusrite owns Novation, uh, which is more connection with uh, open force, I think. Novation is all about making electronic music. It does synthesizers, controllers, uh, launch pad, which are Kind of a good companion for Ableton Live. So, uh, and I, at the time um, when when I met the people at Focusrite, mm -hmm. Focusrite was interested in starting to make a software, which they didn't. So when I joined, I actually worked on the first version of Launchpad, uh, which was released uh, early 2013. So I, I did that by myself with uh, with a designer, Mariam. So it was kind of a Quite a ride, um, and and then we expanded. We created two two diff two other apps for iOS a bit later, uh, and then we released another studio uh, on Mac and Windows, uh, which is I wouldn't say it's a DAW. Actually, the the code name for for it was not a DO, so we didn't really want to make a DO. We we wanted to kind of make something that uh, help beginners and help yeah, beginner musicians to get ideas quickly, get inspiration, which is something that's not really addressed by, by the market today. Uh, yeah, and I think that's it. That's where we are today. Uh, just released a studio uh, three months ago. Um, and yeah, working on it at the moment. Great. And Paul Shanna also has just joined. Hello, Paul. Ah. Um, this he is told me world. he would. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's great to, to, see, to see this very quick overview. I mean, like, and, and we can go back to, to some of the things you've done, um, starting with plugins. This, there is a kind of a, a golden generation of, of people uh, in, in, in both our age range who in the 90s were you know uh, straight out of university starting to work on on plugins uh and oh, uh, i'm just going to add uh, one of those plugins so um because it was just new i mean there was no plugin in the 80s and and then the 90s uh, avid started to, to to offer this program to build plugins and uh, and a new generation of, of developers started to, to make very creative uh, or not i mean like a lot of the plugins are compressors limiters and and you need that for music production uh, but you guys are at uh, at Home Force, the Home Boys. Uh, it was a, it was an old man thing, or is it just a joke called Home Boys? By the way, I just see that on. <laughs> yeah, it took us when I, so when I joined it was already uh, Home Force. There was quite a lot. Actually, the initial name for this one was Space Boy. So the the code name for for that plugin was Space Boy. Well, you, it's a basically it's a it's an, a delay. It's got two lines of delays and, and four tab delays uh, that fit those lines. Um, I guess it all becomes, I don't know. I think we came up with homeboys and then we started to make actual play on game, on, on naming, play, play on, on word by naming all of subsequent plugins. So the next was, was Fromage with an OHM. We had Predatum, we had like Homicide, uh, yeah. That's yeah. We just we just loved. Just I think we're just having a laugh. It was just about having fun. So if you go back at that time, I mean, when we started in the year two thousand, it was the beginning of BST. Um, there was a couple of of, of companies. Uh, Native Instruments was there already. Um, Propeller Heads had released uh, Rebirth, which was amazing at the time. It was so mind blowing, uh, running on on very slow computers. I mean, yeah, I think. 
at the time it was Pentium processors. So it was 150 megahertz CPUs. It's, it's basically the power that we had in the first iPhones when they were released in 2005. So yeah, it was not much CPU. And there was also the Pro Tool systems with the TDM. I don't know if you remember, so those plugins running on actual DSP chips, which were very expensive, amazing, like one sample latency that was crazy. Um, that was really good, uh, but like completely out of reach of most of the musicians. It was kind of the beginning of like the idea that, oh, maybe we can start making music in, in our room, right in our bedroom. And we were maybe a bit political. I mean, we wanted to kind of disrupt the market to come up with high quality effects um, that were affordable. So actually we had we had demos of our plugin, but we, we had also like a version, I can't remember the name of that version. We had a, like a 10 euros version of each of our plugins, which you could, buy, uh, you could buy. And the only limitation of the license is you weren't supposed to do a commercial, make money basically with that. So for 10 quid, uh, you had a plugin. And then if you make money and buy the pro version, the normal version. Uh, so we did that in 2002 or something like that. It was the time where all the plugins were pretty expensive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember a time where I think w the the Wave series uh, from um, yeah, uh, they, they were like over two thousand euros or something. So like plugins uh, have gone to a journey and they're about to uh, to go on another one with the release of, of the Apple Silicon. But we, we'll talk about this a bit later. I want to stay a bit on plugin because um, you guys were very creative and I think I think that, that was your brand uh, and it was visible as, as it is on the design. I mean, it's a bit esoteric and. Uh, I don't know what, what what someone can understand by seeing it, uh, you know, but it, it's definitely memorable. Uh, but there's one thing that you did uh, that that imprinted on me, and, and I'm sure many others, um, is is the, the the freedom and the creativity on the interface design. So you, you created some some things that looked a bit arbitrary, but they were very creative because there's so many parameters on any plugin. You know how how can you control all of them? So, so you find you did find creative ways, and uh, I was wondering if, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think one of the thing we did, uh, we so Laurent was the head of like the DSP guy. He he had tons of experience. Actually, he had started uh, working on on audio software when he was maybe thirteen. Like he was, he had already when when I joined the company, like maybe eight nine years doing audio software. So uh, he kind of the angle he started was to make sure um, we were putting the quality where it mattered and make trade-offs where it didn't. So for example, all the modulation uh, were uh, at much lower rate than uh, the, the process, the main process, things like that. Um, so we could save CPU there. And so one of the things we did actually starting straight from Homeboy, as you can see here, is I don't know if you see my, uh, we can't see, maybe can I do that? Oops, no, I can't. Um, let me go back to this. I think I can do, yeah, I think I can point. Yes, I can point. Uh, so yeah, so this, this this screen here, this is actually a modulation. So it's an LFO, mm -hmm. um, but it was per parameter. So for each parameter you would select, the UI would show the current modulation for, for that parameter. So we had a contextual modulation for all the parameters. So it was a way to actually add a lot of modulation for real, very small um, screen, screen estate basically. Um, and we had a way to kind of highlight which parameters were had modulation. Um, so I think what we wanted to do, we wanted to take very simple effects like delays and 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 basically push them to the max we could at, at the time uh, while keeping a lot of, of quality. So for example, if you look at, um, I think there is another one somewhere, uh, the Quad Fromage. This one was a filter with tons of modulation. So you can see um, here around that place that we had expanded the modulation at that time. 
Uh, we had an LFO, we had an envelope flower in the middle and, and an envelope generator that was generating like ADSR on like triggers on, on the signal. And the envelope follower, uh, you could select the source. So you could uh, you could open this little thing here and, and, and select the source where, where this was coming from. And one of them was the output. So you had like feedback be straight in. The idea was how can we make something that's going to be highly dependent on, on, on the sound you're playing um, and, and just bring a bit of, of, of randomness, of surprises in the, yeah, in, in this very sterile world of like, you know, very high quality, but very limited uh, plugin at the time. So how did people respond to those? Because it's unusual and, and sometimes people know what they're doing. So they, they, they want an action to have a, a, a predictable reaction. But uh, but some others don't, I suppose. Yeah, I, mean, that's, I hope people reacted. I think we had uh, people who loved it, loved what we did, um, and people who just hated it. One thing we did though is we we had for each of those pretty funky interface, we had actually some more traditional UI. So for example, this one, which is a distortion, like four bands of distortion and compressor, uh, we had more like a classic UI which was you know, supposed to kind of suit the needs of someone a bit more serious. Like in, imagine you're in a studio with your clients, uh, you I don't know, you're working in advertisement, whatever, you don't, you don't really want to show this. Um, so, or, or funky little guys here, so you'd rather have this, which was a bit more serious. Uh, so that's kind of how we, we try to also make them look more accessible for people a bit, bit older, maybe a bit less funky. Uh, than us. Okay. And, uh, uh, yeah, so, so go on. No, no, I was going to say, I think maybe things we, we I know we were young and it's very easy to criticize in hindsight, so it's always very easy, but I think what we did is we, we did this that we enjoyed doing. We didn't really care. We did rock and roll. Uh, and even if we had like documentation and everything, we didn't necessarily made it easy on post of Facebook. If you look at, at this bit of the UI, uh, let me just try to draw there, this bit. So this is the preset system. And that was pretty insane for the time. Because, so if you press one of those buttons, you have basically eight preset. And if you press one, it would actually morph. So all the, all the, the knobs start to move. And you had, like in that case, you would have one second here of, of morphing time, you could set it up to one minute if you wanted and have very slow evolving stuff. That's not necessarily what you want as a musician when you want to, to, to have quick ideas. So the way if you wanted to browse all the presets here, you had to press this little store button here that would open like basically the interface of your uh, OS and you would have files and you would open them, that would load them. Then you have to go through all the eight buttons to try them and then repeat to open again, select another file. It was the opposite of practical. It was really not practical for actually. But our main focus was more around creative things, around like how can we morph presets together and things like that. So we didn't really think, think through necessarily completely. Um, we reworked this a little bit on later products, but uh, I think that didn't really help uh, people to, to I remember, seeing, I remember seeing this on the, on the GRM tools and some people might remember yeah. the GRM tools, uh, the freeze, I think, had this interpolation between presets, which, which was remarkable because you, you, you create a sound that, that's pretty unique and then you create another sound that's very different. And then the idea was to, to slide between one and the other setup so that you would have, um, you'd have a very different sound. Yeah, you had the, the big slider yeah. and all the presets. Yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. yeah, that was, the, and I, yeah, I think this kind of interface, you know, that, that creates uh, creative solutions is, is very important in design today because, you know, computers are uh, expecting clear instructions. You know, you can't be vague with a computer, um, but, but creating that indetermination of the result uh, and, and give, give control back to, to the users to be creative, I think is, is, is very important. And I, I imagine that it, it was that kind of creative outcome that were motivating you at the time. Yeah. Yeah, try to do something new, something with a bit of character, 
uh, something also that wouldn't necessarily um, that would sound good all the time. So for example, like if you looked at, at Pro Tools at the time, you had like delays and stuff like that. But if you were to change like the delay duration, it would click. Or if you were to change, I don't know, like some kind of distortion or anything, it would click. Um, and what we wanted to do is everything has to be smooth. Everything has always to be usable in live, basically. Uh, yeah. So then, uh, the, the, then you you did something else. You you stop you stop doing plugins. You maintained them, I suppose, but then you moved on to building a much more ambitious project. Yes. So we moved to another project, which was well, actually we didn't move to. Uh, we we started working on it very early. Um, I don't know if you remember our first. I didn't. I don't have a screenshot of our first website. Our first website was centered, so the whole interface was slightly like this. So mm -hmm. not whole page was like this, which is anyway 2000. I don't know, a bit crazy. So we went to great lengths to be able to make that. Um, and the title, the, the you know the, the title of the HTML basically was designing the home studio. So we started like this, and we really started working very early on on a, uh, basically a DAW, um, which we wanted to be collaborative. Um, I couldn't find, fortunately, uh, the early designs. We, have, we we went to through tons of design, through sketches, um, and it was all within us, like within the group um, of guys here. Uh, we had great ideas around we wanted to do a daw that would allow you to to record yourself and people being able to to partake to um, the session and actually listen to what you've done as fast as possible um, we wanted it to be able to to be cross platform so work on mac and windows we wanted to be able to have plugins so we can get back to that by having plugins that do work on Mac and Windows on the same session is is, is something that's quite complicated. Um, and we wanted to be we wanted to be modular. So we love the idea of modular. So I'm going to show you what it looked like. So this is a screenshot of of the app, and you can see that uh, this part on the on the bottom here shows um, racks of of effects. And each of them correspond to so this, for example, would correspond to to a track here, something like that. So, but that was hidden by default, and we are very proud of that. And and that actually enabled people to make crazy stuff, which was amazing. Uh, but at the same time, it wasn't necessarily what most of the people wanted to do. I think that that's kind of again. I think we. We didn't necessarily ask people what they actually wanted to do. We did something for us. Uh, mm -hmm. We we took the limitation of the existing software as something we wanted to, to break. Um, and so we've done it. Uh, I don't think it necessarily helped with having something accessible uh, for our users. Um, it was amazing. I mean. Yeah, I mean, if, if I just go a bit more on that, I mean, what, what was amazing is you could have more different people recording their track. You could follow what other people were doing. So if you look at the, at the orange bit, ah, you've got someone else here that is actually working on that track and editing it. You can see actually selected um, a track and you can see that in the mixer on, on the bottom uh, here. The mixer here. It was a and very impressive a, dough. I mean, it, it had everything a dough. Yeah. Made, plus the collaboration, which, which was built. Um, yeah. In, in the DNA, in the backbone of the, of, of the software. Yeah. You could put actually, like, for example, like post it notes here. You can see them here. Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. Another thing that was really cool, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I don't have a screenshot for that. But if you were to, you could zoom in. So you could zoom in on, on those tracks. And if you were to do that, um, you would have, you would see the media editor, you would see the notes. So you would, you would edit the notes in, in place. So for example, if you had, let's say a bass and a synth on, on two, two consecutive tracks, you would be able to move 
the notes together of, of the bass and, 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 the, and the synth. It's pretty cool stuff we can't really do in, even even today. So there were some amazing, I think, amazing ideas uh, on UIs. Yeah, I love that um, idea of being able to zoom it, zoom it in and edit the MIDI rather than opening another window. Yeah, yeah exactly. Keep the context. You, you just, yeah. uh, a bit like a map, Google map, where you've got more details coming in as you zoom. That was the same, same principle. Yeah, that's a great um, yeah that, that was that was pretty good um yeah so what, what happened so to your studio what, what was its story like like it, it started as a great idea you had all the ingredients you were talented you had made plugins so you already had content that you could add to it you launched um and then what happened i think when, when we launched so we i remember we put t-shirts t- uh saying something like home studio july 2010 so we were absolutely completely convinced that we would release studio in 2010 um and we had been working on it for quite a while but actually the alpha version was released in in 2011 in november and the beta version was released roughly when i left the company in july 2012 Actually, I think that's when I left. That was the beta. And I can't even remember when the actual release uh, happened. So I think that the, the, the company was exhausted at the time because it took us enormous amount of time to do that. Uh, and I mean, we were still very small. Right. And in terms of, uh, of you know, the, the design, the, the, uh, like everything you do now with Amplify uh, at Focusrite seems to be to be getting an enormous amount of attention. I remember uh, that a, a few months into into the Launchpad app, you, you already had like a million downloads. And and like, are there some some hard lessons that you've learned with Home Studio that that um, at uh, you know at, that 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 you could apply now in in your um, mm. new role? Yeah, I think I think we did. We. Like I think the, the the biggest bit is we didn't really think in terms of um, outcome, in terms of of who is going to use the, the 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 software and what do they want to do, but not in terms of solution, in terms of um, not technical features, but more in terms of what in general. So I I, I want to be able to re- that's really my I want to create a piece of music. That's, that's kind of, that's my real goal. I, I don't. My goal is not to have a, a modular part there. My goal is to be able to to find things easy to to to, to make my music very easily. Um, and, and I think that's what we missed. What we missed is we didn't ask people what they wanted to do, and we didn't think in a way where we would put the user first. We were thinking in terms of oh, I would be great if we could do this, and it would be great if we could do that. Um, and so what we did is we we created for all those contracts amazing tech. So, so for example, Raphael, who is um, another engineer there, who is amazing, he's super smart. Uh, he worked on the collaborative engine, but he also worked on, on the core of the um, UI library, which is amazing. So we, we wanted to, he's running on, on DirectX on Windows, OpenGL on Mac, and we want, because we wanted to have a lot of fluidity because we knew um, uh, collaboration needed, you need to understand what happens. So you needed to have a lot of, um, 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 animation to show things you don't control. So you've got time to understand what happens. So for example, we didn't want to see a, a pattern disappear. We wanted to it flip and, and disappear. So you understand someone else has, has you know, rem- removed it rather than moved it out of the screen because you couldn't make the distinction otherwise between someone deleting pattern or moving it out of the screen. So if it was moved, then you would see the thing scroll. So we did a lot of work to to make that happen before even starting really the studio itself. So we had uh, we had Raphael work on his own for quite some time on the um, collaboration engine and, and the um, the the UI engine, but we didn't have any we hadn't any put anything in front of anyone. And I think that was my main lesson. So when I arrived in in Focusrite. I started Launchpad alone 
in something like November, and we released it in February. Wow, that's super quick. Um, but yeah, I did tons of, I mean, ton of shortcuts. I'm not necessarily proud of it. I was to talk and admit that we did, did allocate, allocate in the real time thread or anything. We, we did stuff like that because we could, because on iOS, the um, memory manager was pretty amazing. So we could, even if we shouldn't, we did it in, in a few bits and pieces. It wasn't a perfect thing. We cut corners so we could put in front of people. We had a good techni technology base. We had good architecture, uh, but we didn't, necessarily did everything to the best. We wanted first to know if there was there would be any traction. And when there was, then we started implementing features, improving various bits and pieces. And, and it, now it, it's, in a, it's in a good uh, place now, much better than it used to be technically. I mean, uh, right. you know, under the hood. Well, there hmm. is a question uh, that relates maybe to, to, the, to the lesson you've learned. Um, so how did Home Force test their products? And, uh, and did they? Yeah, uh, so we, we had unit tests for some part of the library. Actually, we had quite a lot of them. Uh, I don't think we tested uh, the product code, but all the libraries, so we, we had a lot of, of, of library because we, we actually, it was before Juice, it was um, uh, before uh, Oli, um, iPlug library and everything. Because I see he's there, uh, but it was um, uh, so we had these those libraries that cross platform and we tested them. So we had a lot of tests for them. We had also performance tests for our core DSP. But what we didn't really test was the plugins themselves, like the actual high level things that we could have done better there. So we did an exploratory testing where we just use them in a lot of the AWS, um, and we had beta testers and can I was. Uh, yeah, as it was done at the time, you know, we even like um, um, testing first wasn't wasn't in fashion at the time, you know. But we did have tests. Okay, so so fast good, forward. Good question. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, I, th I think I think uh, uh, there's ton of lessons learned there, and I, you you hinted at at this. Uh, knowing your your user, knowing who you design for, and and you said uh, we design for ourselves, and I think there's these two trends, you know. Um, I mean, the designers, what, what is what I, I think is taught in design school is that you need to design something that you have an interest in that solve a problem for you. Uh, but so the primary idea needs to be to come from from the heart, from somewhere where you know there's a, a profound need. Uh, but then uh, in, in software development, we always uh, sort of w are warned uh, to not design stuff for, for ourselves. So, yeah. so I think there's a fine I, line in between the two approaches. Yeah. I think it, yeah, you're right. I think I think it's particularly true for let's say I'm going to design a chair. I'm going to I'm going to design something for humans. And then you're you're human, so uh, there's so many things you need to think of. I don't know, like if, if it's uh, something in the everyday life, if it's going to be in the kitchen, it has to work with, with anything you're going to do in the kitchen. I think even if you are yourself uh, going to use a kitchen, you still need to take some time to really think through what someone is doing in a kitchen. Uh, and you may not be that much of a kitchen person actually yourself. And if you if you extend that uh, a little bit, you could I, I, because we talked about this already before uh, this interview uh, and actually thought about a counter example to that and there i found two uh, i found one which is formula one so in, let's say you you are a designer and you need to formula you need to design the formula one car wheel i don't know if you've seen a wheel like this it's fucking mental it's got like 100 buttons and and and, and displays and things and and none of those guys who design it uh, will be able to drive that car they have to ask the driver Anyway, so they're not really designing for themselves. It's not a, a usual car. It's not a, a, a car for humans. It's a car for a Formula One champion. Right. And so look, when you design for a highly specific, um, you know, or another one would be a spaceship, like, uh, you know, SpaceX. The guy who designed it won't go in space. They won't, they won't, they won't you know. So there's a few, or even like a very high quality, like a strong bias. It's not this, I mean, probably the guy with the violinist, a good one, but not necessarily an exceptional one. Um, 
I mean, that's maybe a bit more of a limit in terms of example, but you see what I mean. I think depending on what you design, there are some cases where you, it's not yourself exactly, it, it, you know. Uh, yeah, no, there are no, some of course, no. yeah, no, for sure. So how do, how do you go about finding out what, what they want? I mean, what problem you solve for them? I mean, the first, of course, is knowing that you actually are solving a problem for someone else than you. So validate that idea. And you don't need to build a product to know that. I mean, there's, there's ways, I suppose, to go about it. Um, testing testing the idea first. And yeah. so is it something you do uh, in, in your daily daily life? At, at we do. Um, it's pretty hard, but we do. So we're using design tools like Figma or there's other like things to help you design software, which but you don't need to, we actually even like design stuff on paper. So you show to someone, you just explain to him what happens basically. You're trying to fake what you can fake and you focus on the little bits that you, you think are important to design uh, in that particular, particular case. But with modern design tool, you can actually draw and fake interfaces and, and uh, test a, a scenario like a workflow and see if people understand what they're expecting. Um, so we've, yeah, we've, we've done that a lot. Um, I don't think that's what we were doing when I started at Focus, right? We, what we did, we, we went, we tried to go very quick mm -hmm. and, and we kind of knew, well, we knew, we knew there was a market. So we, we had, so the company was working on a launch of the hardware. Uh, so that, that's a bit of, uh, you know, with the, I mean, you know it, but for those who don't know, it's, uh, it's a square plastic square with a lot of pads that light up and you can plug that into Ableton Live and, and then you can control that. Um, and so we knew a lot of people actually bought that bit of hardware, but they didn't understand they actually had to connect it to um, a software. Because most of the videos were just showing the piece of hardware and amazing music was happening, amazing lights, and they didn't really understand it. So they would turn it back and give it back to, you know, to the seller. I can't use that. So we knew there was a market for in that particular case. Right. So what we wanted to do was to just create something that emulate the experience uh, quickly. Right. But that's, you know, not always the case. But we, we started to do a bit more UX after the release of the first version. So we actually started to show it to people or just before the release, actually. Uh, we, the, we, I can show you a few design actually around Launchpad. Yeah, I'm going to bring up your. I, I, I cannot date a few old design. <laughs> are we going to, are we going to see the... some uh, confidential things from. Uh... Well, I mean, it's not really confidential. I mean, we, we showed it already in the public. That's a shame. We, that's, that's, but it's, it's not. It's, it's just not the two of us, you know. Though. It's just the two of yeah, us. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, we show you a few things that I, I, we haven't shown to anyone, but I don't think it's really confidential. Um, we've shown that in our, those, those particular screenshots we showed in another uh, talk uh, three years, four years ago about design. So we, James, one of my colleagues, um, who is now in the development of the iOS apps, uh, can I do that and he can you agree that I would use uh, those screenshots. So that was really early. Uh, Design for IAM at the time, and we had barely, we had no sound, it was just a UI. Didn't really look like anything. And then we started doing something that looked like a bit more a launch pad. And we improved it a little bit to make it a bit more, even better. Even better. You noted here there is basically nothing on the pads. And then we can arrive at a place where we started to show things on those pads a bit later. So that was after we won, I think. That was probably the one of first release. I wonder, I think, I think that was probably close to V1. I don't think we had effects there, so we didn't have, yeah. So was it ever- Somewhere between those two. As skeuomorphic as, as, as shown here? Well, at the time, so that was 2012. And at the time, iOS 6 was released, just released. And iOS 7 was the first OS to actually drop skeuomorphism. So it started to go a bit more flat. But at the time, the OS was like with a lot of, you know, uh, 
three D effects and shadows and everything. Yeah. So and when that I, happened, we actually. So I just wanted to to bring up a comment from Paul, who is a scary icon. Yep. But Paul was a colleague of uh, of me at Rolly, and then he went on to work with you at Novation. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that refers to uh, to his work at Novation or, or at Rolly, or even at F Expansion, where, where it was before. Uh, but one, one favorite design trick we do is to design only with boxes, not graphic, because then it's pure user experience, not influenced by the graphics. So it's easier to move. And yeah, I, th I, th I think it's a very um, important idea that uh, you don't get committed to the design itself by cutting it, but you just draw it. You work with boxes, you work with with simple elements before uh, so, so that you, yeah, you, you don't go in, in, in the wrong direction too quickly and yeah. get too attached to it. That's true. And actually, we did that for Blocks Wave. So uh, the app that came after um, after Launchpad, where the idea was, you know, Launchpad is ready for beginners. Uh, they don't know how to make music. They're really interested in, in doing that. But they have no idea how that works. And I think what we wanted to focus on with Launchpad was more, how do you, what does that mean to make a to put a break, like stop the drum, put the bass in, more like intuitive manipulation of the sounds to kind of get some kind of um, emotion. It was really intuitive. You were just kind of uh, sound you have and you could just uh, trigger them in. And so you would always start with a full song. All the pads you could trigger, they would, would all, all, all the time work together. I mean, we had, an, we, we still have an amazing content and the guys who do the content are so amazing to be able to do so many kind of genera that do all work together you can use anything and it's gonna always work it's, it's pretty amazing but anyway so for this one for blobs wave we wanted to more have a generator of ideas so you start with nothing and then you would fill up the kind of the, the square you can see on the top that was a very early design um, and we were trying to start to to kind of uh, brainstorm the ideas so we had a lot of i don't want to show you I'm not sure what I can share, but we had a lot of, we tried to. We've lost you for a second there, Jerome. Oh, uh, sorry. You're back. You know, it's good you're back. I'm back? Yep. Maybe when I change the those things, because it's pretty kind of, uh, yeah, require a bit of. Uh, oh, this is data. great. This is great. So, yeah, that was. Yeah, so what I was saying is this, this, this I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a delay, so I, I, I cut you sometimes. I'm sorry. Go on. No, it's fine. Uh, so yeah, those ones were more like frame, you know, uh, how do you call them, like box, yeah, just frames, frame design. Um, but the idea was it would be empty and you would have like uh, something to kind of help you get ideas very quickly. So you would have a lot of content. So all of those were a bit more colored, but they were still very, very simple. Actually, that was a very, very early design of that where uh, we were focusing mostly on, you can see that those early designs where we were using a lot of real estate on the mixer, things like that, where actually uh, wasn't really that important in, in, in the, you know, the journey of the user, which is why we kind of got to something more uh, related to content. How can I get a lot of content very quickly and put them on those little squares on the top? Uh, and then we arrive to something more like this, which was pretty cool. So this was, you would just click one of those uh, six, well, seven button, it would just give you an idea. So you could like scroll and get kind of nearly random ideas very quickly. And you could fill up uh, like a, a line on the top very quickly. So that's kind of what we kind of settled to at the design. You would still have access to bit more content. Uh, I can't really show that because I don't have a screenshot. Um, but you can see here, you would have here the pair where you can discover discover things. And here you would have a browser would have access to all the content. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the idea. And then we started adding features that our users wanted much later, um, like in, in this bit, basically, where you could start to make things your own, basically, and and, and transform uh, things. And of course, we added record, which 
who wasn't there at the beginning, I think. So yeah, I think this 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 is something we kind of build slowly. So you can you can if you go back to here, you can see that bit too came pretty late. So here we've got a slicer. We can you can take your sample and take little bits of it and completely rejig your melodies uh, very intuitively. That came very late. We knew we wanted to do something like this, but we didn't implement it until probably a few months or, or a year maybe later. Um, so that yeah, we try to focus on the minimum version mm -hmm. uh, quickly. So yeah, Paul, we did use um, some uh, some design like this. Actually, you did too, and uh, because Paul, so Paul is uh, just a disclaimer. Paul is uh, someone who joined on the, joined the team in two thousand eighteen, I think, and started working on a prototyping studio. So he did a lot. I mean. We worked at the team, but he was uh, fundamental to that and working with with us and to get those ideas into uh, a very simple design, which we probably get back a bit later. Uh, on. So this is a product that is the not door product. Yes, right, yes. Okay. It's actually, I mean, it's got a lot of, I think, uh, roots in Blockswave because. Um, Similarly to Blobswave, it gives you access to a lot of content you can put together very quickly. Actually, I can show you one screenshot just to. Uh, so you've got, yeah, basically a lot of content um, there. You can browse on on the left there. But the big difference is that it, it's designed to actually build a song. So the idea with this one was not build an idea, but build a song. Very crude. Could arg song for some people, but for more beginners, I think that's that's pretty amazing. You can you can build a song very quickly, and you can get quite an idea. And then how do you, you know, export that to other um, software if you're a bit more advanced? Um, you know, that that's been part of our thinking. So this product does not have the ability to record, does it? No. Okay. I'm not saying we we'll never do that because <laughs> it, you know. <laughs> I think you just say that you're working on it, but uh... no, I'm not. I mean, you know, we all of the guys here they've been working in, in in the industry for a long time, and we all been working with Ableton Live. I mean, we we not we Ableton Live and Logic and all of this apps, and we know why it's great to be able to record your yourself. But when you think of it, recording is it's pretty tough. Uh, so how do you make this more easily? I guess. There's a question here. Do you work with external designers for the graphics? Um, no, we don't. We we do have designers like in, in the company um, that work on other products or in marketing, and we've been working with them. Uh, but also a lot of our software engineers do work. For example, I can show you uh, this, which is, so we use Sketch, Sketch is a design tool, and you can see a very early design of Studio that I think Paul, Paul made, or maybe someone else, but I think it's Paul, and it's completely made up of, of nothing. We use, so the little waveform you see is actually box wave, um, and so we, we, yeah, we just designed it ourselves, basically, um, but we still have feedback from designers in-house. This is very, um, very interesting question. Or and I, I might, I might take you in a different direction for for a second. But you know, people, people who come to the music hack space, people who watch maybe today, um, are on a, on a spectrum from artist to engineer. You know, and then they could be full time engineer or or also artist, and or some of them aspiring to become maybe an engineer, but to work in the field where they have a passion, which is music, uh, and. There's, there's many jobs. I mean, like the, the, the only job is not being a C++ developer uh, to, to make plugins. There's design even more uh, important now. Uh, the graphic design, but also the, the user experience design, which is a very important field as well. Uh, and I, I wanted to, to get your, your sense and, and uh, your insight into how your team is built and, and how many different skills 
you know, uh, could, could, could come. Like you don't need just programmers. You need people who think uh, about the users, who think about uh, how it integrates within a larger um, uh, outcome. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, so I think, so yeah, you, you, that's true. With C, like being an, an amazing C++ developer is not enough. It helps though. I think it's really because we are a team and we've got people with different um, focus. So for example, we have people doing UX all the time. So their whole thing is like, when there is a new idea that comes that comes from the team, they want to test it as fast as possible with users. Um, a lot of us do have a bit of, um, you know, familiarity with design tools like Sketch and Illustrator um, or, or others. Um, but we're not necessarily a specialist. And I think some of those UIs um, that are really advanced, like when I say advanced, like they are really looking amazingly complex, uh, super beautiful. Uh, in that case, usually you've got um, a designer that is in position of, of decision in a way. So for example, like for Homeforce, if you look at those amazing UIs we had at the time, we in the team we have uh, Greg, uh, who is uh, Greg Maclet, Gregory Maclet, who is um, draws. Actually, that's a very bad example because that fromage thing was actually made out of carved cheese. So you know, uh, I can explain to you later uh, how great. that came to be. Uh, but uh, this one, for example, of or that or that, are all coming out of his brain. He, he's a musician, but he's mainly um, a designer. He draws, he draws comic books and uh, yeah, he's just an amazing artist. So having him in the team uh, really at the core uh, can allow those kind of things to happen. Um, and then there's other ways you can do that. So you can have a very strong um, product design team. So someone who's just in charge of how everything looks and there is either one person or a committee that kind of make sure uh, we respect some kind of rule to make sure they can look at the same brand, um, which is more of what we're doing in Focus Right, I'd say. So it's not necessarily one person, it's more like a group of people that come together. Um, I guess you can't have such uh, extreme design in that case, it's a bit more, a bit more uh, you know, you need to, please more people, so it's going to be maybe a bit more, st not standard, but um, um, less adventurous. And uh, <clears throat> how about research? I mean, re re research is, is very important because, you know, th th there is going to be, there are going to be changes brought about by machine learning. Some, a lot of them have been, um, uh, then music information retrieval has transformed the way we listen to music with Spotify. The fundamental research, the basis of, of, of listening today is this um, extra metadata that, that we can put on music so that it's easier to sort out, easier to stream, etc. Um, but research will impact continuously the design of, of new products for music. And, and what, what is your relationship with, with that? And, and is there anything that you have your eyes on? Any... any um, a partnership that you're you're doing maybe with uh, with universities or, or researchers to uh, to get a you know um, an edge you know for your products i mean i don't know how much i can answer on this um we i mean we we are of course very interested in everything related to um machine learning and what you can do with this kind of algorithm um it would I think for us, it's always the angle of can that, where does that fit in, in the user workflow and journey with, with the product? So I think what we wouldn't necessarily ha do would be, and, and that's arguably not a good thing or a good thing. You know, it's, it's, it's just a thing we don't do. We would, what we tend to not do is we take an amazing idea, uh, an amazing concept that's crazy and we, uh, make a product directly just on this. I think what we pretend to do is we say, okay, that looks that looks amazing. How can we test that? 
probably within the context of something that already exists or uh, you know try to kind of augment what we have make it better uh, rather than beat everything on making a product because making a product is just long there is the research part there is a design part development part the testing part you know it's just a long a long process and you kind of want to fail as soon as you can that's um, a great quote I, I just wanted to to put that in ice for a second uh, <laughs> you want to fail as soon as you can this is this is this is great can you develop on this? Because I mean, uh, I recognize some truth in that, but I, I, want, I want it more. Yeah, um, I think okay, it's it's so so. You know, when I joined the company, um, the company was making hardware. I mean, you remember you were there? We had very long projects. Uh, they were they, making hardware is just hard, and you have to think about everything. If you 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 want to go from a concept then to, to, to production. And you don't want to miss anything at production. If something is missing, that's very bad. It's going to cost you a lot of money, even like, you know, it's going to be horrible. Um, so the company is very well organized to do that. Like I think Focus Right, one of his, uh, his friends is just very good at delivering hardware and making sure that's the right thing. For software, we, we wanted to, we didn't know exactly where we're going. We wanted to, you know, try things and so we we try to do things differently we cannot try to see there, there's a lot of uh, uh, literature around agile and how you can develop in a more in a leaner way and not necessarily actually uh, software it's also in hardware in toyota you know there's a lot of stories around that um, but for software so we looked into this and agile is all about this i think it, it's about failing fast putting in front of users and see if, if that works very quickly. Um, and so what we would tend to do is you, you have a people in mind, you think, that's, I'm pretty sure that's where we're going. We're going there. What we did with your studio, we just went there. And then maybe it wasn't exactly what we wanted to, but we just did it. And then we put it in front of people. The idea there was more like, oh, I think we're going there. You, you start on the way. And maybe that's not exactly what you want. Then you pivot a little. So you can you can actually move a little bit your goal and say, oh, actually, maybe you can change slightly the goal, and that's going to be this. And yeah. you continue. Your, and so instead of like spending a year doing something and then pivot, you can actually uh, change all the time. And so you basically you're failing as fast as you can, and you, you yeah you go much much quicker in in the good direction because you can right, change right. it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, have failing publicly or failing internally? Um, I think it could be both. It could be both um, failing internally. So we actually did uh, some mistake at some point. I mean, you could argue some mistakes. So, uh, for example, we one thing one, one of the challenge when you have products like Launchpad is that it exists for now six years seven years it's been around and you can imagine that uh, it's not like uh, maybe plugin we've done in the past when I don't force but in, in, in the company at focus right a lot of, of, of plugins you can see um, I, what they tend to do is like they're released and then they're maintained so it's a lot of it there is no new feature then or, or, or there is a v2 but but the what you're paying for is a plugin, it's a set of features, and then what you're paying for is going to work on your host. Your host is going to be updated, your host is going to be updated, and your plugin is going to still work. So basically, what you're paying for is the maintenance of that. Something that Launchpad actually has, has been released when iOS 6 was released, and now it's iOS 14, well, soon. Um, and a lot of, of OSs have been released, that thing has completely changed, even the, the language has changed. So we've switched language midway. So there's a lot of, um, it's not maintenance, it's actually we need to rewrite things. And that's something we we had to learn. And so, some of the bit were actually we learned the hard way because we spent a lot of time doing that rewrite. And now I think in inside we, we probably do that differently, uh, maybe fail a bit faster. So we've actually failed in some cases um, to do that uh, nicely because we, it's such a big undertaking and we kind of failed to split it in little bits. 
So was um, releasing fromage was it was it a failure or a success? And then uh, related to, to the question by architect, uh, how, how does releasing a free product like fromage affect the yeah. company? So fromage were our second product. We released um, homeboys first, and we wanted to reach more people. So I think fromage has been downloaded at least a million times, which is a lot for a plugin. Something like this. I, I mean, I'm okay. I'm not completely sure. Um, yeah, I tried to confirm that with the Force guys, but I think it's a million times. It was free, it was everywhere, um, and and that helped us because we were very small. We couldn't do advertisement at the time. So at the time, there was a lot of um, you know advertisement in, uh, in in newspaper, newspaper were in, in a much stronger position than today, and and it was pretty expensive for us to to, to do that. So, um, and it wasn't that long to make. So again, we had a lot of uh, fun making this. So we did that by carving a piece of cheese um, and, and basically put it on a photocopier, get the base of the UI. And we actually kept it in a, in a freezer. And then we had um, a contest. So you could, I can't remember the contest, but you, you would win a fromage hardware. And the hardware was the actual cheese. So <laughs> that was fun, uh, but that was, I think quite fast to do this one didn't take us too much time. Right. So, so it's um, worth it. I, I suppose I suppose the answer uh, and, and a lot of people are here, I suppose as well, are starting looking to start their own business or may, maybe have an idea they want to take it further. And, and it takes so much more than just development programming skills. It takes also marketing and ideas and, and design. Uh, and, and yeah, marketing is an important one, like aw creating awareness of, of who you are, what you do, uh, all of this t t is important, takes time and you have to sacrifice some, uh, some of yeah. immediate money to, to, to build your audience and, and build your, your community. Um, I, I have a completely different mm -hmm. uh, question or taking you in a different direction, if that's okay, unless you want to comment on this first. I would just say that uh, that was really hard for us at Home Force to do marketing. We were a bunch of designers and, and engineers. We didn't really know how to do it. Um, and we didn't really realize how much time it would take, I think, to, to do that. We, but because we had a lot of character, uh, you know, the company, what we we're doing, and with Greg instilling his uh, ideas that I think we, we had so much character that in a way kind of saved us by being very different from the others. But I think what we lacked was maybe some a reach, some kind of reach, uh, wider audience. Um, and there is a lot of things, I guess we don't, we didn't do, and I know we do now. Like thinking about what the brand is, what does it represent, um, you know, these kind of things, and, and try to get, you know, um, high level concept in in what you do to do it, like just communication. You need to find angles to communicate, and you want this to be consistent. So it, it's pretty, pretty. Deep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the June direction that I wanted to 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 go on is um, we hinted at it at the beginning. So the plugins have been on a journey since the nineties. You know, from um, a niche thing for studio engineers, very expensive to commoditized, democratized. Everybody could could use them. Now with Apple Silicon um, and the release of this hardware for developers to test an environment that will allow every Mac laptop to also run iOS apps. And, um, and for, for those who don't know, um, most audio apps now, uh, they're built on the model of uh, Audio Units V3, the third version, which is, is actually a plugin. So it can work in GarageBand. And the expectation is that this audio unit can also work uh, that that is built into an, an iOS app can also work within any uh, DAW. So you have like this, I don't know, 50,000 uh, iOS apps uh, that compares to about 12,000 plugins, you know? So there's like five times more iOS apps that do music than there are plugins. And all of these are going to be available for Mac. I don't know if, if it's as soon as Big Sur or if it's a bit later in 2021, but it's coming. So what do you think is going to, the, to be the impact on, on all the plugins developers out there? And would you recommend anyone who is looking to build a business to actually start a, a plugin business? 
Huh. Uh, I, I, I prefer not being responsible for recommending anything to anyone because <laughs> that's, that's a tough recommendation. Uh, I think well, what I would say first is the uh, word of plugin is very, very, very quoted now uh, compared to where it was when we started. There is an amazing amount of, I mean, the community is amazing. Um, I think it's possibly a bit easier to do plugins just because there's much more resources, um, you know, um, to, to just get the various bits done. Even things like juice help tremendously to, to get started. You're just right from the start, you can actually do a UV3 and, you know, and they're targeting now mobile. So um, I think it's easier to do. Um, but you also, that means also there is much more competition. Um, even for the user, it's not necessarily easy to kind of choose and find the right right thing. And actually, uh, iOS suffers from, from exactly that. There's so many apps, it's actually quite hard to find what you want. Um, and among all those apps, music apps, a lot of them are probably not very used just because they don't have the visibility. Um, so I don't necessarily recommend doing a plugin today, I think it's, it's, it's hard, uh, just because of the sheer amount of developers and there's a lot of competition. Um, in terms of using the iOS apps on a DAW on Mac, as far as I know, it's not necessarily completely clear cut. I mean, the AUV3 is actually supported, uh, it's a format that exists for Mac OS and iOS, so it's the same format. So yes, technically it's, it's possible, um, I think you're, you're right. I think that will, will be possible. I don't think that Apple has actually stated that it's going to be possible. Um, so I wouldn't bet it on it yet. I would wait for at least uh, having access and, and try and try it. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I might be jumping the um, gun a little bit there in my. In but my, you're right. I think it's uh, uh, it's, but the, it's, it's the very idea, likely. right? That the idea, anyway, yeah. that that yeah. these apps um, and many yeah. other iOS apps can can, can yeah. work. I mean, yeah. Um, so it wouldn't be all Macs, but on, only the new Macs that would run those the same, basically the same kind of CPU uh, and ARM CPU than iOS. Uh, I think also another problem is that a lot of those apps are actually designed for a touch interface. Um, and, and so that, that could make things not necessarily very easy to use on, on Mac OS. Some interaction may be designed so you can use many of your things at once and, and you just can't do that on, on Mac. So, for example, with the Lone app, actually, it wouldn't necessarily be very easy or, or great to use with your finger, your mouse. Mm -hmm. So, I think, yeah, that, that, that would be uh, a challenge. Um, and there is another technology called Catalyst, which I found maybe a bit more interesting. The idea is that like, you can take your app. Um, well, not more interesting, just just different because I, it's not necessarily uh, addressing the AUV3 problem. But what's interesting is it, it allows people who develop an iOS app to very quickly deploy a variation of the app on Mac. So they get started pretty quickly, in theory at least, and then you can uh, change that part to actually match it, match the Mac use case and the usability of Mac. So that allows you to, you know, use iOS technologies, but design something a bit more for Mac. Whereas the support of the app straight out of the box is just going to be an app for iOS on Mac. And I think, you know, it's, it's not going to be necessarily the best design. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a challenge to solve yeah. for yeah. you if you want to try it. Yeah, and an opportunity as well for, for those who, yeah, especially for yes. those who already have apps running on iOS. I, th I think for them, it's going to be a choice of, of of adapting the code they already have developed to, to a new platform and, and new case studies and, and new UX. So, um, yeah, I mean, if if people watching have an opinion on this subject or have questions, you know, we're gonna keep going for for a little longer, uh, maybe five, five ten minutes. So don't hesitate to, to, to ask any question if you have. Um, so, yeah, so so yeah, we, we closed on this. Uh, Apple is full of, of surprise. Every couple of years, there's something new that's coming. Um, 
uh, I would like to go back to collaboration. Uh, collaboration. We, we, we can talk a bit more about, about Apple Silicon because I think it's got its challenges for, for some, actually not necessarily for the young developer, but possibly also for the industry at large. Yes. So uh, imagine like, you know, big names in the industry like Ableton, Native Instruments, um, Digidesign, all those big, those guys have been around for a long time. They've, and we, and us, I mean, uh, focus right. We uh, have apps that's been out for quite some time and, and having this being released very soon, actually, uh, is, is, is a challenge. I think there is potentially some technologies that may be not working or things like if you're using a library, you don't have access, you don't have access to the source code of, uh, then in a way you're kind of screwed because you need your third party to recompile it to, to that new CPU. Uh, so that's that challenge. Um, and, and some code may be optimized for um, Intel. So some DSP mm -hmm. code in particular. And so you will need to re-optimize it for ARM. Um, which is doable because we, we've done it internally. We've got all the, we haven't actually talked at all about Groovebox, which is a pretty cool app actually, but it's got synthesizers and melodies and uh, the user is a bit more, maybe a bit more advanced, a bit more, uh, yeah, someone who knows, you know, about what a synthesizer is and things like that. And this runs right now on, on Intel and, and, and Mac and, uh, and ARM. So that's, that's doable, right? Quite right, and that's part of of the uh, of the business of of a life of a developer is is not what people know about the most because you know a twenty something who's out of university wanting to, to to get a job and what they want is to build something that's meaningful and and like yeah. there's there's a very big part of the job that is about maintaining cross-platform applications and make adapting to all of these uh writing commercial code is is not always fun not every day um yeah i think one of the things we say is like developers are lazy so they're gonna still do as much as they can to avoid doing this thing and just do the interesting bit which is why now we've got a lot of tools that um, i advise you guys to have a look into things around continuous integration, so things where, I mean, if you guys use um, uh, source control like Git, you're probably using GitHub uh, because that's the biggest one and it's easier for you to kind of share your code with people. But if you do that, then you can expand with things like GitHub Actions where everything you do can actually be built all the time for you and you can test and you can basically make sure everything you do as, as it scales still works. So you minimize basically the amount of, 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 of time you spend. But there will be moments where, yeah, where we, we, you will have to spend some time, yeah. Like Apple Silicon uh, right. is one of those, yeah. So, yeah, we, we just have uh, f five minutes left. Uh, but I, I uh, well, a bit more, but I wanted to talk about collaboration. We, we did touch on it and your experience at, 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 um, uh, at um Force building um Studio, but I've seen so many attempts to, to do collaboration that I have some questions for you. What do you think is, is a primary uh, interest from users in terms of collaboration? And if, if you were to do it all over again, you know, what would it look like today, a modern door that would support creative collaboration? Mm. I think I wouldn't start with this. Also, I think, okay, that's maybe easier to do today. At the time, there wasn't really any any solution for DAW um, to start with collaboration. Um, but for example, the the technology that is used in Home Studio is now a library called Flip uh, that uh, you can actually license and use. And so, if a young developer, I'm pretty sure you can have a good deal. So you can, uh, yeah, um, they are trying to, to push that. But I think that's that kind of library, that kind of technology, I think you should, if you're really interested in, in implementing it, you should implement it right at the start, but not necessarily exploit it yet. So focus on, on first your product and see if there is a need for collaboration because there's so many different kind of collaboration you may want. So for example, like 
people have more and more devices. They've got a laptop, they've got an iPad, they've got um, a mobile, whatever. Uh, and potentially also web, they want to see things in the web. So you've got a lot of ways to, you, can, you want to see and manipulate your data. So you can collaborate with yourself to begin with, making sure everything you do in the train uh, is available at home on your bigger you know, laptop. So that, that's one thing. Then there is some kind of collaboration with other people. Um, that comes, a, I think, a bit later, you know, by, by nature of it. So if you look at something in Google Doc, the first focus is by you and your documents, but you can also share with people pretty easily. And, and when you start doing this, usually you already, you, over, you already have something advanced, you've already done something, and then, then the, the need to, to share it with someone and have input and everything just comes a bit later. That was a kind of maybe asynchronous collaboration. So you mm -hmm. basically, it can be real time, but it's just a bonus. Uh, essentially, what you're trying to do is just work with someone in a loosely coupled way. And then you've got things like on the stage, you know, you want to, to perform in real time together in the same place, which is yeah, another, uh, um, another level of, of uh, collaboration. But fundamentally, if your, your, your software, your, your product, whatever you're doing, is not adapted to um, to the core of, of what the user wants, then then yeah, that that's not really useful to add collaboration. Um, if, yeah, if I was to start again, I would try to build in, but not use it yet. There's so many complexity. I mean, we can start of, like in terms of developers, the complexities around around collaboration. What kind of things that kind of so things like conflicting actions, different people doing things on the same part of the UI or, or your document. There are things around um, uh, undo and making sure people can undo independently from each other. Um, things around um, making sure you understand what the others are doing. So if you don't have any indication of what the other people are doing, you, you, you can have, it's going to be weird, things are going to change, you won't understand what happens. There are so many cool um, software today, particularly in the web, where they, they are uh, adding a lot of effort in, into these kind of things. Uh, so in fact, I don't know if you've tried Miro, it's a kind of a, a whiteboard software, an online thing to, to kind of collaborate on ideas with many people. And it's a pretty cool way they do. When you log in, for example, you can see all the change that happened um, when, since you last logged in. Right. The things that, you know, so you've got a lot of additional features to add, just to add uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it can be a distraction uh, from the product in a way at the beginning. Yeah. Well, th th there's been so much hope in the past 20 years that the pain of like carrying very heavy files and not being able to, to send them for someone else to, to come in. I mean, this was partly solved with WeTransfer and Google Drive and iCloud and other sharing system. But it's, it's still pretty heavy and lengthy to send a two gigabyte projects to, to someone else. So that's, I, th I think at the time, 20 years ago, there was a lot of hope that this problem would go away in a different way where we could just look at the same thing. Google Doc transformed the way we work on documents. And, and for sure, this is one where um, the, uh, the the collaboration, you know, there's no going back to not Google Docs. So like, yeah, absolutely. What's in there? Yeah, it's so much for yeah, a, a lot of expectation from users also now. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I think for music is is not yet the case that um, that the um, the features uh, of collaboration are clear enough and desired enough that there is a a, a non going back point that has been reached. Yeah. not for music anyway. No, but there are more and more experiments. I mean, as the architect says, yes, exactly. So you've got um, Endless, it's a pretty cool yeah. app designed around live you know, collaboration. That's right. So that, yeah. Yeah, and it's completely new. I mean, this is not solving a problem that people no, have. It's, but, but no, it's, it, it's, which uh, is great. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fantastic feature. And, uh, and yes, Tim was on this channel talking about it and, and it all stemmed from his own practice as a live musician, but then he, there's a collaborate the social interaction feature was built on top and it's it's remarkable and uh, I, th I think is onto is onto something 
very interesting mm. that that sort of yeah that thing in the middle that musician all act on you know uh, th there's also some some ways where you can be destructive of others uh, and he has he has invented a new word for it which uh, i'll find it uh, but yeah i mean there is there's another thing like if you don't you've looked like soundtrack or one lab those apps so one of them is uh it's kind of a big, uh, big startup. The other one is actually Spotify, uh, and they so they're online. They're in the cloud on the web. It's a web web app, but they're really focused on another aspect of collaboration, which is more like a social network. So you basically making the music is part of of the experience, but you can share your your sounds with people who can follow you. There's a bit of a SoundCloud aspect to that, but with yeah. the ability to, to make music, which is really interesting. Also, it's, it's another kind of um, a social interaction. Uh, yeah, which is yeah yet another pretty uh, new experiment, uh, which is I think really interesting, really promising. Yeah, really. yeah. yeah. So. Great. Well. Um... Martin Rivera, just to finish the subject on this, uh, to take the opportunity to thank whoever has the loopback feature in the Foxtrot interface drivers. Well, I cool, I'll make sure they know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Oh, there, there was also another question. That I, uh, well, this is the industry plugins user. Uh, plugin users. It's very hard to quantify, isn't it? Yeah. It's pretty hard because, you know, like instruments, this kind of things, we've got numbers through dealers, uh, distributions, it's like, but for, for plugins, uh, it's actually, there's a lot of different channels to get plugins. Um, yeah, if there is no report their sales. No. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a bit difficult. Well. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, 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 there are some estimations that I've seen around in the past where, um, the estimation whether the plugin market was maybe half a billion, uh, but that, that that's kind of um, an upper limit, I would think. I think it's less than that. Yeah, and I think. Yeah, and I wonder if it's if it's yeah, is it growing or is it shrinking? Also, uh, it's hard to say. I, I feel like plugins are, are cheaper nowadays in general. Yes, uh, which is the way good. I mean, that's what we wanted when we started Homeforce. We wanted for the plugins, um, but it's not necessarily uh, sustainable. If 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 the market is too small in terms of users, then uh, yeah, it it, it it can be tough. I think it's really a great uh, something we haven't. I mean, I don't know how much time we have. But something I wanted to just quickly touch on is when you're alone, when you when you work alone on something, you're basically a superman. So uh, it's what I call it like you're hyper productive because yeah. and actually it can bite you back because when you start having more people joining you, if you've done, if you've been too hyper productive, everything you do is basically unusable by anyone else. They don't understand your code. There is no test. You've gone, you've gone straight to the thing. But I think for the plugins in particular, it's really good. If you start alone, you can go very quick, put your ideas very quickly there. You, you're super, you know everything about your product. And you can get to something very quickly, and you can also you don't you just have yourself to pay, so you can also afford to keep the cost low. Um, so that's also an opportunity. Yeah. Um, scaling yeah. is very hard. Yes, scaling is hard, but yeah, and expensive. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah, keeping things under control and keeping one salary on the sales is 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 some, something that many many people uh, have done at the rate of the. Uh, in the late 90s and, and 2000s um great well um i'd like to thank you Jerome, for for joining this live stream and sharing your 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 experience it's a, it's a great path um and moving countries i mean same as me i mean we, we do we do share a lot yeah. of stories we, we share yeah. we've worked for two of the same companies the grm and and focus right um mm -hmm. so there's a there's a, it's great it's great to, to see uh where you are now uh, and, and and open it, open it, share it with the world. Um, eight years after the first time you came on with the music hack space, well, we have some um, uh, so some love for Martin and Architect. Thank you, thank you guys. It's it's great that thanks you, Martin, thanks Architect. Yeah, so thank you for staying. Good luck. Uh, you're an aspiring dev. Well, that's good. That's great. I encourage you to uh, to to come and exchange and and use the um, 
use the forum as well to ask questions. We, we, we're having more engagement now on forum.musichackspace.org. Andrew, oh, Andrew, who's coming to come to give a fantastic talk, no pressure, Andrew, uh, in September. <laughs> Um, Andrew designed the Kitar, the, the Roland Kitar, and never remember the model. Sorry, Andrew. But um, as, as an instrument designer, he's built so many, so many things. Nice. Um, I'm yeah, looking that, forward to uh, that. Yeah, me too. I'm very much looking forward to it and I'm very happy that, that he joined tonight. Um, so, yeah, so many people who came. Uh, Brian Botches came uh, earlier and say hello. Um, uh, who works for Archer here now. So, fantastic. Paul Chenna, of course. Thank you, Paul. Great to see your scary icon there. Uh, <laughs> but th yes, yeah, thank you for staying and commenting. And uh, yeah, thanks yeah. for no pressure. Thanks for having me, JB. Uh, it was it was super great. Yeah, very right, relaxed, well, you, very interesting. You're welcome anytime. You know, anytime you want to join again, uh, you must welcome. It's a pleasure. We can talk more about things around designing apps for, you know, uh, mobile and, and what kind of challenge there are stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Well, anytime you, you anytime you're ready to spill some secrets, you know, uh, you know, you know where to find me. <laughs> yeah, I know your secrets. No, Just kidding. Well, okay. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you, everybody, uh, and uh, we'll th we'll see you on Monday. We have two live streams uh, next week again. So on Monday we have Marek Bereza. Marek Bereza is, is, is if there was a poster boy in the dictionary for uh, music hacker that. I would like a photo of, of Marek. Uh, he's, he's been designing guitar pedals and guitars since he was uh, 14. Uh, he's built several iOS apps on his own. He worked at Apple in the prototyping um, uh, department uh, at, in Cupertino, and he's back now in London. Uh, and uh, he came also eight years ago, nine years ago even, uh, to present uh, a synthesizer he built for the Raspberry Pi 1, which was a, a long time ago. So is is He's all over the place in terms of design, hardware, software, you name it. He does a bit of everything, and he's going to to come on Monday to talk about about a few things, uh, including the Tinsy. Tinsy is one of his interests, and and you can build a synthesizer on a Tinsy for less than ten pounds. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. And uh, on Thursday we have Oli Larkin, who was here earlier. I don't know if he's still around, but. Oli Larkin is, uh, is, has released iPlug 2, which is a spin-off iPlug, making it better. And it's going to, uh, to announce some new features of this um, plugin framework um, on Thursday. So yeah, I hope to see many of you uh, then. And uh, always a pleasure. Uh, there will be no live stream in August. I'm taking the months off to prepare a very good start of the year in September. So. Jerome, thank you again, and I'll see you thank all you. soon. Bye-bye.